Hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today. I think the biggest difference between us and other animals is the explosive development of our intellect. Of course, animals are way more intelligent than science used to think, but their accomplishments pall compared to designing a rocket to go to Mars, which released a robot to crawl around taking photos. So it's bizarre that the most intellectual creature to ever walk the planet is destroying its only home. There seems to be a disconnect between the clever brain and the human heart, love and compassion. Only when the two work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. At any rate, because of this, we're now having to tackle the often devastating effects of climate change and loss of biodiversity. How sad we brought all this on ourselves by our disrespect of the environment and animals. What we have to remember is that we are part of and depend on the natural world for air, water, food, everything. Science has proved that just being in nature is good for our physical and mental health and greening a city reduces the crime rate. But we depend on healthy ecosystems in which each interconnected species of plant and animal has a role to play. And as more and more species vanish from an ecosystem, it weakens and may collapse. The destruction of the environment is caused by several factors, including poverty, ignorance, the unsustainable lifestyles of so many of us, and international corporations competing to produce the cheapest products. Also, there's this crazy notion there can be unlimited economic growth on a planet with finite natural resources. In other words, businesses and governments put short-term gain before protecting environment for future generations. Many people ask me if I really have hope after seeing so much destruction and suffering in so many countries. And I want to stress that for me, hope is not just wishful thinking, it's about action. I see our species as at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel. Right at the end is a little star shining, and that's hope. But it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and wishing the star would come our way. No, we have to roll up our sleeves and crawl under, climb over, work our way around. All the obstacles on between us and that star Things like poverty, climate change, loss of biodiversity, unsustainable use of natural resources, population growth, industrial farming, and all the rest. Of course, there are people working on solving each of these problems, but so often in silos, which is unfortunate because these problems are interconnected and they need to be solved cooperatively. As we all know, there's a good deal of armed conflict in many parts of the world. And this not only results in suffering and death, but also has a harmful effect on the environment. There are many reasons for such conflicts, but a major one, as for many animals, is over access to territory and natural resources. Therefore, the push to restore exploited and polluted landscapes is desperately important today. One of my reasons for hope is the resilience of nature. Places that we've utterly destroyed can, given time and perhaps help, be restored. Nature will take over. One example is Gombe. In 1960, when I began studying chimpanzees there in Tanzania, Gombe was part of the forest belt that stretched right across equatorial Africa. But by the late 1980s, Gombe was just a small island of forest surrounded by bare hills. It was poverty that had driven the local communities to cut down the trees for land for growing more food or making money from timber or charcoal. And I realised that unless we helped them find ways of making a living without destroying their environment, we couldn't, we couldn't save chimpanzees, forests or anything else. So JGI started a holistic method of community-led conservation. And it's been super successful and it's alleviating poverty as well as restoring the environment. 
From the very start, we've worked closely with local communities, listening to their needs and taking their advice. There are no bare hills around Gombe today. They're covered in trees, many of which grew from seeds that had lain dormant for years or from roots of the felled trees. In addition, there are many tree planting programs around the villages. So now the communities, understanding that protecting the environment isn't just for wildlife, but for their own future, they've become our partners in conservation. And this is in six other African countries as well. One important aspect of conservation is to create corridors that enable movement of animals between protected areas. When large animals are confined to one area, there'll be inbreeding, which can lead to genetic defects and eventual extinction. I'm inspired by the many rewilding programs occurring in different parts of the world. When large areas of land are set aside, animals that became extinct due to hunting or habitat destruction in that area can be reintroduced from other locations and a lot of wildlife returns of its own accord without our help. Intensive industrial farming has a devastating effect on the environment and biodiversity, especially as it relies heavily on the use of pesticides and herbicides. Not only are these harmful to wildlife, but they're actually killing the soil on which we all depend. Moreover, it's washed into rivers, ending up polluting also the oceans. It's thus encouraging to find that more farmers are turning to regenerative farming, permaculture and so on, methods which, by working with rather than against nature and using less or preferably no agricultural pesticides and herbicides, allow the soil to gradually regain its fertility and biodiversity to return. Recently, thanks to Itai Rothman, his family and other volunteers, a chapter of the Jane Goodall Institute was officially registered as an NGO in Israel, the 26th chapter around the world. And one of its goals is to work on projects to restore degraded environments, working with indigenous people as we do in Tanzania. JGI Israel hopes to work with local communities, including the Bedouins, on projects to reflood wetlands that have gradually been drained in the past 70 years. Wetlands are not only extremely efficient in capturing CO2, but they provide habitat for a great diversity of plant and animal species. This is the environment which supported the Bedouin people of northern Israel, often called the Marsh Arabs, for hundreds of years. JGI Israel also help, hopes to help restore the arid savanna and open woodland in cooperation with the Bedouins of the southern Israel Negev Desert. As you know, we're in the midst of the sixth great extinction. Thus, it's encouraging to know that there's an increasing number of endangered animals who've been given a second chance. This has sometimes involved captive breeding, and once there are enough of the animals, with good genetic diversity, they can be carefully released into places where they once lived, thus creating a healthier ecosystem. This is where zoos have often played an important role. While unfortunately there are many really bad zoos, more like prisons, things are improving, and a number of good zoos are engaged in captive breeding programs, which have actually saved some species from almost certain extinction. Some animals, extinct totally in the wild, were found surviving in zoos, and so captive breeding programs were started, often involving cooperation between zoos to improve the gene pool. Arabian oryx, for example, were at one time totally extinct in the wild, but as a result of successful breeding programs in zoos and sanctuaries in the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East and North America, Many of them are now back in their natural habitat, and scimitar horned oryx were saved in the same way and have been successfully returned to Chad, part of their original range, which is in North Africa. 
Sometimes the last few animals on the very brink of extinction have been captured from the wild for captive breeding programs, and these have enabled those animals eventually to be returned to the wild. I try to share as many of these stories as possible so that more people realize that these efforts can be successful and then can be replicated for other endangered animals. On the Arabian Peninsula, many animals such as Arabian leopard, adax and Syrian brown bear are endangered and already there are groups dedicated to ensuring that they don't add to the growing list of extinct species. Of course, it'll take collaboration of zoos, scientists and governments across the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East to successfully reintroduce these and other animals into the environment where they once roamed and ensure they're protected. I should emphasize the need to raise awareness about these issues. Here again, good zoos can play an important role by providing information, especially to children. JGI has a program, Roots and Shoots, that empowers young people from kindergarten through university, where, by the way, it's very strong, to get involved with projects to protect the environment and animals. There are active groups in 65 countries now, including Israel. The young people choose projects such as planting trees, doing beach cleanups, learning about wildlife and getting out into nature. Outdoor learning is especially important for young children. They're naturally curious. They're fascinated by what they find. They want to learn more. And then hopefully they'll become stewards of the environment as they grow up. I believe that every school should include the environment as a subject in the curriculum to include the threats we face and the ways we're working to solve them and what they can do as individuals. As you know, nature disregards boundaries between countries. How wonderful it would be if conservationists and politicians across the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East collaborate to protect and restore those habitats that are artificially separated by political boundaries. This would be a wonderful example of working across political boundaries to promote harmony between people and the natural world on which we all depend. So finally, I hope that this is a very successful, productive conference and that Israel will commit to a national strategy for ecological restoration. Thank you so much.